Welcome to a conversation on international affairs. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Sir Ralph Derendorf, an eminent sociologist, a distinguished academic administrator, and an important European political figure. As a sociologist, Sir Ralph is the author of 27 books, including Class and Class Conflict in Industrial Society, Society and Democracy in, Ger in Germany, and most recently, The Modern Social Conflict, an essay on the politics of liberty. As an academic administrator, he served from 1974 to 1984 as director of the London School of Economics. As a prominent European political figure, he was a member of the German Parliament, Deputy Foreign Minister, and EEC Commissioner. On the Berkeley campus this semester, he is the 1989 Sanford S. Elberg Lecturer in International Studies. So Ralph, welcome to Berkeley. I thought we would walk through your distinguished career by starting in the beginning, actually. And, and you were, where and when were you born? I was born in 1929 in Hamburg, in Germany. And that was a, the very turbulent period, obviously, in Germany. That was a particularly turbulent period in our family, since my father was a social democratic politician. Uh, at the time, a member of the uh, Hamburg Diet, a little later a member of the uh, German Parliament, the Reichstag, and thus among those who, uh, who were in the middle of things, really, between the Nazis and the Communists uh, pre-1933, and then, of course, immediately or very soon arrested and without a job, and we moved to Berlin, yes. And, and he was actually arrested twice. I mean, was he sent to a oh, concentration? He was arrested, uh, first of all, when most um, <coughs> social democratic MPs were arrested in the summer of 1933, came out again um, around Christmas time that year. Then he was later in the resistance, and uh, after the 20th of July, 44, he was arrested, tried, and uh, sentenced, he was fortunate, sentenced to seven years prison, of which uh, he, uh, well, he went to prison and then uh, after the war was released by the Russians. And, and what, what, what do you remember most about growing up? The discussion of politics around the dinner table or worrying about well, the police? it's not as simple as that, is yeah. it? It's what I remember most is how public life, political life, impinged on one's private existence. I mean, I, my parents um, tried to make it possible for me to grow up uh, relatively undisturbed, didn't work very well, and uh, certainly by the age of 11, um, I, uh, I realized that um, there was a sort of difference between the family view and the prevailing view, and a dangerous difference at that. And later on, I myself got involved in uh, in the opposition to the Nazi regime. And you were, in fact, arrested as I was, in fact, arrested. We had spread um, truthful information in schools, in our own school and beyond, and had written rather incautious letters to each other, a friend of mine and myself, which, uh, uh, which the Gestapo got hold of, and uh, I was arrested after my father had been arrested and put in uh, a camp, yes. And you were arrested in 44 and then uh, a year? No, no, it was, uh, what happened was we were arrested in uh, late November 44, kept in um, cells in a prison in the first instance and then in a camp east of the River Oder in what is now uh, Poland. And then um, on the day on which the Russians moved up to the order, which was the 29th of January 1945, <laughs> this friend of mine and myself were literally kicked out of the camp by uh, one of the SS people, given a little document which said, these boys must never attend a secondary school in Germany again. <laughs> 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 Nothing without documentation, even under the most horrible regime, and we just got away, whereas many of those with whom we'd been in the camp uh, were killed in, uh, subsequently by SS guards and uh, in the confusion when the Russians came. So um, we were very fortunate to get out. 
And and then you, you did you, your father returned to, to my politics. Father returned to politics in um, what would in the Soviet zone of occupation, and then ran into difficulties again because he was uh, a leading social democrat. He was deputy chairman of the East German Social Democratic Party, but he resisted the attempt of the Russian occupation forces to uh, force a merger between. The Social Democrats were a Democratic Party and the Communists into the so-called Socialist Unity Party, which still governs East Germany. He was against it. And there was a dramatic uh, moment in February 1946 when he voted against uh, this merger, was uh, asked by the uh, Soviet officers in East Berlin to come and see them informed his uh, British and American friends of this, and they came and said, we'll protect you. We were then living in the American sector of Berlin. We will protect you. And they flew him and me out of Berlin almost immediately because uh, incidents had happened of the Russians capturing uh, uh, people in the Western sectors of Berlin and of Austria. So it was, as you can see, it was a, a, a childhood and youth which um, which was very much under the influence of uh, events of totalitarianism, to be exact. I mean, really, my childhood and youth were an experience in totalitarianism, and it hasn't left me that particular experience. And then you, you chose uh, uh, to pursue higher education uh, after the war and, right. and, and chose sociology. No, uh, no, I chose classics and philosophy and, uh, and did both subjects in the University of Hamburg. And uh, in 1952, I got my first doctorate in uh, philosophy uh, with classics as the subsidiary subjects. It is only after that that I went uh, to London, to the London School of Economics, and, uh, and did what was then in Europe the new and unknown territory of uh, sociology, and uh, did another doctorate there. And how did uh, uh, this, this formative experience influence the, the topics that, that you wound up looking at? I know that one issue that has been uh, uh, of great concern to you is, is the problem of liberal democracy and why it did not take root in Germany. Well, that's certainly true, although uh, the book which I read about it is somewhat later. The book it was written in uh, 1965. And it was based on lectures, which I'd actually first given at Columbia University in New York in 1960. Um, and certainly that was one of my subjects. Before that, I suppose my fundamental interest was in an approach to society and to the world in which we are living, which I would describe as enlightened Kantian um, 18th century, um, an approach at the core of which was my firm belief that uh, the regulation of conflict is the secret of liberty and liberal democracy, and that um, if we don't manage to regulate conflict, if we try to ignore it, or if we try to, to create a world of ultimate harmony, we are quite likely to end up with worse conflicts than, um, than if we accept the fact that people have different interests and, uh, and different aspirations and devise institutions in which it is possible for people to express these differences, which is what democracy, in my view, is about. Democracy, in other words, is not about uh, the emergence of some unified view from um, the people, but it's about um, organizing conflict and living with conflict. And that was my, my first um, fairly well-known book, really, on, um, on uh, class and class conflict. And in the Germany book, I applied this, in a way, to German history. And I tried to point out that very often in German history, people had had an unfortunate tendency to look for the one answer, the great leader who has all answers, or a system which brings about a unified, harmonious view, which in fact means that some uh, arrogate to themselves the um, uh, assumption that they have the one view and uh, many interests can't be expressed. So there was a relationship between um, the class book and, um, and the Germany book. 
And, and what did you find were the conditions that made uh, uh, this possibility for managed conflict a reality? Well, I've often been uh, charged with uh, having applied, even at the time, the uh, British and American experience to uh, German history, which is undoubtedly true. But um, it is in Britain and America that these conditions were most evident and that it was accepted that there were, on balance, two major groups, those who had something to lose and therefore, by and large, defended the status quo and those who um, had little to lose and certainly a lot to gain and, uh, and therefore argued for change. And these two social and political groups dominated a system which we have come to call democracy. Now, Germany, on the other hand, kept throughout industrialization um, what is often called an authoritarian group, a, uh, a more traditional uh, ruling or upper class group, which sort of set the tone and decided everything and didn't recognize the interplay of, uh, um, of, the, of the haves and the have-nots, or as I put it before, of those who had something to lose and were on the defensive and those who had aspirations. Uh, what has it been like for you, uh, having had this very formative experience, having focused on this uh, 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 problem of, of conflict management and, and the, the salvation of, of liberal values, to deal with a period like the 70s, for example, uh, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the 60s actually, and the early 70s, the youth protests that, that we witnessed at that time. What, what, was, what was your reaction, not so much in, in, in necessarily in terms of the policies that you were able to apply, but in terms of your feelings and your, your intellectual sensibilities? Well, can I say first of all that throughout the period we've been talking about, certainly since 1948, I sort of straddled cultures and spent some time in Germany, but a lot of time in Britain and indeed in all about two years in the United States as well. So, uh, so I had some sense of what was going on in uh, different parts of the world that was relevant to me. But the 1960s were very much my German years. And I suppose many people would say today that, um, that in that period, I was one of, the, um, one of the spokesmen of protest. But the left wouldn't say that. The <laughs> young wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. Because while I was involved with them in this permanent debate, and it was almost like a traveling circus, one went from one university to another, from one place to another, it was very often the same people on the stage, some representatives of the, of the students, I almost said of the revolting students, but I quite liked them. <laughs> I quite liked them at the time. Um, and some representatives of a slightly older generation who nevertheless believed that it was necessary to engage in debate. So the 60s to me were a period of almost continuous debate. In my lectures at the University of Tübingen, I had up to 2,000 students. I talked about democracy in Germany, about conflicts, about these subjects. It was one of the topical subjects. So partly within the university and partly outside, a decade of debate. And I was one of those who argued that it wasn't good enough to have rebuilt the country after the war. It wasn't good enough to have had a long period of economic growth. After reconstruction reform was one of the slogans I remember well, and one of the slogans which I actually stood for. It's I'm not in the 70s yet. I'm still in the 60s. Yes. Uh, and, and because your career is so rich and varied, we're, we're going to have to uh, uh, move back and forth. But, but I want to, because we have a, an American audience, a California audience, uh, I want to clarify one point in, in the sense that you are a classical liberal. You are a member of, of the, the, uh, the, the Liberal Party, or were, of West Germany. And, and that involves a commitment to certain uh, uh, civil rights, political rights, and, and social rights. And I, I want to, to, to clarify that point in, in any comment that you would make about 
uh, uh, helping American un uh, audience understand that, that agenda, which was the liberal agenda, which was in part undoubtedly the agenda that you were uh, defending in these, in these controversies. Yes, I'm glad you make the point because uh, the dreaded L word isn't, <laughs> yes. uh, isn't at all dreaded in, uh, in Europe and certainly not for me. But it means something slightly different from um, liberalism in this country. Or, you see, I've come out of a social democratic family, which really means out of a family which was in favor of social reform, of the welfare state, of produce, providing more opportunities for a wider uh, group of people. And I've always subscribed to that idea, but contrary to the social democratic tradition out of which I came and into which I had originally grown, I have always placed the greater emphasis on individual life chances. Individual life chances. Now this to me involves above all two things. One I share with social democrats, which is the insistence on human rights, individual rights and civil rights, mm -hmm. which, uh, which I think is of fundamental importance, is a universal proposition, is true everywhere in the world, but it's something which one has to defend at home and has a lot to do with my uh, youth and childhood and the totalitarian experience. It's a sort of gut reaction that one defends individual rights wherever they are in jeopardy. The other is that um, um, social order or social structure has to offer a combination of a breadth of opportunities and um, a sense of citizenship for all, a combination, in other words, of access by citizenship and of wide choices. But I've always insisted on these choices as well as citizenship, and that, I think, is perhaps the liberal nuance in uh, my own thinking, and to some extent in European liberal thinking. It's a traditional reformist liberalism, a liberalism which is in favor of changes which uh, offer more opportunities for choice as well as more rights for everybody. And it's that particular combination which I have espoused. The party to which I belong hasn't always and certainly not entirely subscribed to my views. Uh, indeed, there probably isn't a party which, uh, <laughs> which uh, subscribes to these views in its entirety. And uh, I've always been a bit of a loner, although when I went into politics in uh, 1966, 1967, I, um, for a variety of reasons which I can't fully explain, very quickly rose to um, a certain amount of visibility and prominence. Uh, what today, given the, the conflicts of the 60s and 70s that we've, we've uh, gone through, the, the reassertion of a, of a conservative agenda, if not a theory by Thatcher and Reagan, what is the liberal agenda uh, today, uh, in your view? Well, the 1980s, as I see it, and most of these things which I associate with particular decades started a little earlier in the United States than in Europe. But the 1980s were really characterized in the terms which I have just used by an attempt on the part of some leading politicians to extend the range of choices for those who can make it, never mind the citizenship rights of everybody. And so they have encouraged um, a new Darwinism, a new uh, uh, struggle for survival of each against everybody, um, and um, the sort of casino capitalism which we have seen in this decade, and they have forgotten, this decade has forgotten, the need to make sure that every human being in our societies is a citizen with full, or has to be a citizen with full access to economic, social, and political opportunities. And so the agenda for liberalism today is, in my view, to correct the one-sidedness of the 1980s by a better combination of opportunity and access, a better combination of, as I put it in my new book, The Modern Social Conflict, of provisions, that is choices, and entitlements, that is citizenship rights, and so um, to balance the, um, uh, the one-sidedness of the 1980s. And what about an issue like the environment? Uh, how does that fit into this equation? That's a very good and a very important question, what we are discovering in, uh, in the late 
1980s that there are two and perhaps three issues which uh, seem to override everything and which defy traditional categories of analysis. One is the nuclear issue which uh, is very much with us to the present day and more so at a time at which it looks as if more and more countries are getting nuclear weapons. The second is the environmental issue not in any manageable regional sense, but in a global and extremely threatening sense for which we may see first indications uh, possibly in certain changes of climate. And the third may well be the, um, the biological issue arising from um, genetic engineering. And uh, I would agree that they are very much on the agenda of the 1990s and perhaps transcend the sort of analysis which uh, I have just offered and which I used to offer in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Is there any particular uh, uh, problem that comes to mind with, with regard to international affairs? I know at St. Anthony's College where you were the warden there has always been a, a, a commitment uh, to, to concerns with international matters. What, what, what are your thoughts there coming from this particular background having focused on these particular problems? What, what are the liberals' concerns about uh, uh, international relations? The main concern of the liberal with international relations is the maintenance or defense and extension of multilateral institutions and rules. That is to say, the search, if this doesn't sound too utopian to our audience, for a world order, the search for ways of uh, uh, creating international constraints on the action of companies, countries, and ultimately individuals and groups. Now this is not a very popular issue in uh, the 1980s, and I doubt whether it's going to be very popular in the 1990s, because we've really gone through a phase since the 1970s in which some of the international institutions we had have been, um, um, if not destroyed, then um, to some extent dismantled. and. Uh, and I'm afraid the United States has been very much uh, a part of that. If you, if you remember the, uh, the sudden termination of the Law of the Seas Conference or leaving UNESCO or threatening the World Bank and um, every single year or uh, uh, regarding the United Nations as essentially an enemy of the US or disregarding decisions by the International Court of Justice. There's a whole string of anti-multilateral, anti-international actions by the US and other countries haven't done much better. But the liberal agenda would be, let's hold on to what we've still got and let us find ways of making sure that we can create effective international multilateral institutions by the decisions of which we all abide. Incidentally, we won't even begin to come to grips with the nuclear, the environmental, and the biogenetic issues if we don't create international institutions of that kind. I would like to now cut into your career in a, in a different way because uh, we, we've looked at, at the themes that you've pursued as a, as a scholar and intellectual, but let's talk a little about the, what, what I see as a, as a movement between two worlds, the worlds of, of theory and, and the world of action. Uh, uh, you comment in your new book about who your mentors were, and, and let's talk a little about them, and you identify this important theme in, in many of their, their careers. Uh, I have in mind this, this brief experience in political life. Yeah, it wasn't so brief. I, uh, um, I was campaigning for two full years in Germany, and while being elected very soon to the land parliament of one of the large states of Germany then to the federal parliament, and then of course as a European commissioner, American papers often described us as officials, but um, I think <laughs> it was really a, uh, a political job as a member of the commission. So it, it was really seven years in politics. Well, I suppose this question of theory and practice is in a certain sense the real theme of my life. and. <laughs> And it's a very complicated one. Um, one of the mentors I quote is Max Weber, who of course was the man 
who uh, in his important writings at the beginning of the century and then again around the time of the First World War, distinguished quite dramatically, almost unbearably dramatically, between investigating facts, the world of science, and advocating programs, the world of politics. To him these were two necessarily divided and separate worlds. And while he didn't rule out that the same person moved from one to the other, he did rule out any facile union or uh, any facile merger of these two worlds, or indeed any, to use the language which is most alien to me, the Hegelian language, any dialectics of theory and practice, which is just one of those words which uh, fudges the issue. Now, I do believe that the two are different. I do believe that these are two worlds which you can't easily relate. I've never, sometimes people have said to me, it must have been wonderful for you to apply your social science to politics. I've never seen it that way, never. In politics mm. you have to win votes and you have to get things done. And it's not applying social science, it's a totally different, totally different thing. Similarly, it is not that you actually apply your experience in practical life to your scholarly investigations, although it may make a certain difference. So there are two worlds, two different time scales, two different sets of constraints, but one person can be a part of both over time, and that's what I've tried to do. And, and in, in what way, if any, does one experience inform the other? Uh, is, is, well, there any, is there any connection there between the two? Well, it's a big subject. First of all, we are, of course, in our own world, encountering increasingly people who have straddled theory and practice and who continue to do so. And I have naturally become quite interested in the whole structure of policy advice, um, the world of Brookings and other institutions and indeed um, institutes of international studies which advise uh, practitioners by accepting their ways of formulating issues, their timescales, but using some of the methods and qualities of scholarship. So that's one way. But if, if you really get down to it, you see the real difference is this. In the practical world, you do not determine the questions which you have to answer. Mm -hmm. And you do not determine the time scale within which you have to answer them. In the scholarly world, in the best and strictest mm -hmm. sense, you define the problems which you deal with and the time scale is in principle unlimited, although the, your funds may ran, run out <laughs> before you actually got anywhere. But in principle it's unlimited. You can't tell when you are going to find answer. Maybe tonight, maybe in 20 years time, maybe never. Now that you can't afford in the practical world. And these different time scales make for a totally different rhythm of life, mode of thinking. And uh, I would resist for quite a long time the notion of one informing the other in any direct way. I think they inform each other through the experience of an individual person, or they can, but not in any other sense. I have a quote here about the, the, the work of uh, uh, the politician from Weber, and which uh, is not incompatible with anything you just said. He says, this is the decisive psychological quality of the politician, his ability to let realities work upon him with inner concentration and calmness. So, well, so that's you, right. Yeah. That's right, whereas the real quality of the scholar is to be, I'm almost tempted to say, unperturbed by mm -hmm. reality in pursuing the, um, uh, the problems which he or she have set themselves. Now, what, what about an academic administrator in all of this? <laughs> you were a head for 10 years of the yes. London School of Economics. This yes. was a, obviously a, a time of very great pressures on the university, both from students and from, uh, 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 from uh, the politicians, I guess one would say. Comment on, on what you just said about these two worlds. Is, is, is the university leadership a, a special case where there is more uh, commingling of these two? Is this an academic administrator asking for advice? <laughs> that's right, that's right. No. <laughs> yes. Yes, I suppose what I've called straddling 
it's a little easier if you uh, are in charge of an academic institution. Although, I as director of the London School of Economics have always regarded it as my job to protect academics from the obsession with uh, realities, even the obsession with funds. That is to say, if you do administer, if you are in charge of an academic institution, you really have to see to it that those who are there as academics uh, can do their job. And so you have to relieve them of, of some of the burden of living in the real world. Nevertheless, uh, I have enjoyed and continue to enjoy being in charge of academic institutions precisely because it enables me to be a part of both worlds. And, um, and uh, as I've now said several times, straddling, straddling theory and practice, straddling, I suppose, Britain and Germany, straddling worlds is something which uh, I find almost existentially necessary. Are, are there any particular challenges that, that the universities confront these days? I mean, as, as you were saying, uh, uh, protecting the financial resources of, of the faculty so they can pursue things. I mean, that's, that's a problem. The, the universities, at least in the United States, are having to reach out more to raise money. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of, of concerns about the kind of research one can pursue, uh, whether uh, a greater concern about animal rights or genetic engineering and on and on. What, what, uh, what important challenges do you see out there that... Uh, that uh, uh, from, uh, from a European point of view, and this is of necessity different in the United States from what it's like in Europe, from a European point of view, the greatest single challenge is without any doubt how to maintain the uh, um, cutting edge of research and inquiry into new subjects after a period of enormous university expansion in which all the pressure is on dealing with a larger number of students and in which there doesn't seem to be the space anymore for uh, uh, research in the traditional sense. That I regard as the biggest single challenge. Uh, many political reactions to universities spring from this uh, particular challenge, inability to cope with expansion financially, um, a change in the, uh, in the social value placed on academic institutions, that is a lower social value after this period of expansion, and so on and so forth. In practice, this means um, preserving um, corners and pockets of creativity in a world in which um, all the pressure may be towards mediocrity. But um, it also means um, preserving an undepressed <laughs> academic um, self-confidence um, in an environment in which academia isn't exactly popular. And, uh, and this is not easy. It is in many ways defensive and has in recent years led me to advocate something which I suppose I have to say twice in order not to be misunderstood, and that is the importance of moral minorities. I repeat, moral <laughs> minorities. <laughs> yes, that explain that, of, please. Uh, please. Of corners of an awareness of the need to uh, move forward rather than uh, a defensiveness, a protectionism, economic, social and cultural, which is so widespread in our world. That is an awareness of some of the civilized values which uh, have made the best things in our world, including the best things in our universities, possible. So it's a slightly defensive job to be an academic administrator these days but one which can be, can be done in a way which, I hope, uh, keeps pockets of, uh, of excellence alive. Uh, what particular uh, uh, issues arise because of this, the problem of a changing world order? What, what is the responsibility of universities with regard to, to training students, uh, giving them both a, a sense of from whence we've come, but, but this world, this new world is out there. You mentioned the commitment to multilateralism, for example. How, how does one bring that to the, to the university? Uh, I'm grateful to you for that question. There's, there are two answers to it, really. The simple one is um, that those of us 
who have a sort of professional interest in internationalism and uh, as warden of St. Anthony's College in Oxford, which is, as you say, a college specializing in area studies and international studies in general, um, those of us who have this responsibility must make sure that these pockets or islands of internationalism um, are not squashed by, uh, by um, a prevailing trend to look inward. So we educate young people in awareness of the world and uh, promote research. But the other point, which is equally important, is this. If you go back and look at the origins of the um, post-war order, which is perhaps post-Second World War order, which is perhaps so far the, uh, the most impressive example of an attempt to set up a whole range of international institutions, starting with the United Nations, but going on to the uh, International Monetary Fund and World Bank, and then the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and a whole lot of subsidiary institutions. If you look at the origins of that, you will find that most of the ideas were actually thought out during the war, and mm. many of them within university institutions. And indeed, there were one or two committees in this country. One was a committee of lawyers, but one was a committee of university presidents, and uh, there were university institutions. It is extremely important that when the moment comes in which it is possible to take a new leap forward in international institution buildings, the ideas are there. And these mm. ideas can only be produced by institutions which are not constitutionally a part of the political timescales which we've talked about, the political space. And so apart from educating people for uh, a world of awareness of international issues, there's also the more specific task to think through um, for example, the, uh, the clear establishment of human rights as genuine rights, the violation of which is sanctions internationally, or the institutions of a new international monetary system or whatever. You will be speaking later today on the Berkeley campus about how Europe is changing, and, and I don't want to uh, asked you to tell me in the, the, the minutes that we have remaining, but l let's talk a little about this. Uh, uh, what, are you surprised by the 1992 phenomena, the, the extent to which we seem to be seeing a, a much greater acceleration of the momentum uh, toward uh, uh, European economic inter integration? To some extent, yes, because um, after its um, initial period of, um, of great activity and progress, the European economic community really went into a long depression which coincided with uh, the prevalence of such words as Euro gloom, Euro sclerosis, Euro pessimism, that is to say uh, people felt that Europe had become hopelessly rigid and uh, had no future to go to. The, that was the period of the 1970s essentially into the 1980s. And then something happened. It's as if people couldn't bear to live in that gloomy world any longer. And somehow new objectives were formulated for the European community. It had something to do with uh, particular individuals. I think it had something to do with Jacques Delors, who's still president of the Commission of the European Communities. It had something to do with President Mitterrand and the the discovery of the European interest by France, or perhaps rediscovery. Um, it also had something to do with Chancellor Kohl, who in his own way, perhaps not exceptionally brilliant, but um, nevertheless in his stubborn way, wanted to promote uh, European cooperation. And so this single European Act was invented, which didn't look like an awful lot at first, which has more preamble than substance but which in its substance then suggests a date and mm -hmm. says by 1992 we want to have created a true common market, one which not only has dismantled tariff barriers within Europe, but many other barriers to the free movement of goods, of services, of capital and of people. And suddenly this 92 caught on and you know from uh, from the insurance companies and other financial institutions to universities which have this great exchange program um, which is financed 
under the name of Erasmus, which is an acronym for something complicated. Uh, there, everybody seems to, um, seems to have found a new sense of purpose. And this sense of purpose has communicated itself to the outside world. So there is a degree of hope within Europe. There is a degree of apprehension outside Europe about this European development, which helps make it real, I suppose. What, what do you see as, as Germany's uh, place in this new uh, evolving uh, Europe? Well, I'm one of those who've long believed that there cannot be a European community unless it is strongly supported by the closest possible relations between France and Germany. And so <coughs> the answer to your question is that, uh, that unless German political parties and German public opinion support the uh, moves forward towards uh, closer European integration, nothing much will happen. And this, of course, is uh, one of the problems in contemporary Europe in that um, Germany hasn't quite come to terms with uh, the attempt on the one hand to uh, put into words, at any rate, the German interest in East Germany and better relations with Eastern Europe and the attempt to promote West European integration. It, will, will the German problem, in, in the sense of the division of Germany, uh, be solved by not being solved, in a way? I should uh, have thought so. Yeah. And, and what, what about the American role in all of this? If, if one looks back uh, at your career, uh, one uh, has to uh, what is your sense of the importance of, of America's accomplishment in this post-war period? Uh, uh, how, how important were we oh, for Europe? And it's immensely yeah. important, all important, I would say. And I'm one of those who who have long admired this country and continue to admire this country for for the kind of civil society and governmental institutions and economic strength which it's brought about. I haven't, I'm bound to say, always admired American foreign policy to quite the same extent to which I have admired the institutions mm -hmm. of the United States. There's been uh, a great deal of uncertainty about American foreign policy for a long time, of course. We had what I've sometimes described as, um, as the Russian doll principle, that is to say, you take the big Russian doll in which Americans and West Europeans are united, NATO, and you open it up and out comes a slightly smaller one which is the European community but which fits perfectly <laughs> into the framework and you open that and out comes Franco-German friendship <laughs> as, um, as the inner one. So there was a sort of quite a close relationship between Atlantic, the Atlantic community, the European community and um, Franco-German relations. This is perhaps no longer so evident, and uh, the next stage in the process of European integration is, here one is easily misunderstood, is to some extent a process of demarcation from the United States of America in Europe, and in that sense a response to um, uh, American developments which are somewhat less open to the world, somewhat less multilateral certainly, and perhaps somewhat more protectionist in the widest sense of the term. So whereas one might say that in the past the United States has actively contributed to the integration of Europe, now it's more a uh, contribution by default, by no longer actively contributing, the US forces Europe to get its own act together. And, and in such an environment, will the Europeans tend to their own security, or are there no longer any security concerns for Europe? Well, now you're raising another big and important issue. The simple answer to that is there are security concerns, despite the fact that it's harder to perceive them. Incidentally, it's harder to perceive them for Americans, um, given Reykjavik and all that, which, after all, one has seen on television and, uh, and perceived. Uh, but uh, it is by no means certain that Europe will get its own contribution to Western security 
as well organized as it should, and I am quite certain that the only way to guarantee Western security for Europeans is to keep NATO going and, um, in that sense, keep the Atlantic Alliance going, hard though this may have become. And in this, this evolution that Europe is going through, what will be its relationship to the East? That We didn't talk about that doll there, but the, 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 the doll of, of the Eastern uh, Bloc, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe? Well, it's an interesting fact that uh, in Hungary there have now even been noises uh, that Hungary might consider some sort of association with or even membership of the European community. So the East European countries regard the European community as an important reality and very much hope that it will not be a reality which turns them away but it will be a reality which is open for them. The Soviet Union, I should have thought, and every indication is that this is the case, is slightly apprehensive about uh, the success of European integration, doesn't quite know what to make of it, doesn't see any economic benefits for the Soviet Union, at least no immediate benefits, and I don't see any, and sort of wonders how this relationship will be worked out, and I suspect the same is true within the European community itself. This is an undefined area of community policy, whatever individual members of the community do, and one which is badly in need of definition in the next few years. You see, the European community has, at this moment, a problem which is quite similar to the United States. It's so concerned with itself and with its own problems and its own developments that it hasn't given enough thought to the effect of what it's doing at home on those outside who are bound to be affected if the community becomes one of the elephants of the world who, whenever they move, um, have a fairly tangible effect mm -hmm. on everything around them. Let me ask you one final question. Drawing on your experience, your, your, your career as a scholar, your, your work at the university, if, if you were uh, uh, addressing a group of, uh, of uh, uh, young adults, as you actually do in your new book, what, 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 what message would you like to leave them with, with regard to the future world, uh, this liberal agenda, and, and their preparation for it? A very simple message, despite the word which I'm now going to use, and a very anti-cyclical message. Live with complexity. Don't try to simplify the world into one in which you live in a homogeneous ethnic environment and in very, with very simple beliefs and convictions because that is a world of war and destruction. The world is complicated. We've got to appreciate that it is complicated. One of my um, visions is a return of a sort of Gladstone approach to politics and I'm thinking of Gladstone, the campaigner, who gave long, long lectures, I'm almost tempted to say, to his constituency about distant parts of the world, explaining the complications of these distant parts. And while it's very unpopular these days, in view of fundamentalism and protectionism and the desire for homogeneity to say so, I think the great counter-cyclical task which the moral minorities have is to spread the message of complexity. The world isn't simple, nor should it be simple. It's rich because it's complicated. Let us somehow manage to live with that. So, Ralph, thank you very much for joining us today. For uh, it, it has been a quite uh, an experience having you here and sharing these experiences and insights with. Uh, us. I must say, as a graduate student, I read your works, so it, it, it's really a great honor to have you come to life here today. And thank you very much, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation on international affairs.
information on this series, contact the Institute of International Studies, 215 Moses Hall, UC Berkeley, Berkeley, California, 94720, or call area code 415-642-2474.